All right, we're going to go ahead and get started because we have three presentations today. Uh, so first up is Bernali Kundu. She is one of the neurosurgery uh, residents that rotated through our neuro-ophthalmology service. She's going to be presenting on the management of visual threatening papilloma. So hello. Hello. So I'll start off with a case just to kind of set the scene. So patient EJ, 22-year-old female, who actually presents to the ED with visual lo uh, loss. So she actually reports having eight weeks of headaches associated with photophobia and phonophobia. And then three weeks ago, she reported she's having what she describes as central visual loss. She can't read things. Things don't have a lot of detail. She can use her outer vision to look at things, but um, uh, she's having trouble seeing. Uh, and that this is getting worse kind of day by day. She's also having just 15 to 30 second blackouts in vision, wishing sound in her ears, and double vision on occasion. So in urgent care, they uh, did an MRI brain, which was read as unremarkable. So they referred her to actually originally an eye doctor, and the eye doctor then referred her to uh, Moran, Dr. Judith Warner. Um, so on a, uh, a past medical history, significant for a 50 pound weight gain in the last year and a half, and though she did manage to lose 20 pounds in the last four weeks, she um, had an elevated BMI. Uh, family history significant for diabetes, hypertension, thyroid disorder, obesity. Uh, medications were bupropion, escitalopram, tramadol, midrin for her headaches. Uh, social history is not significant. She's not a smoker. She does not drink. She works as a janitor. So while the MRI brain was read as unremarkable, I just wanted to kind of pull it up and sh point out just a couple things. So while this is a normal MRI brain, notice that the back of the globes posteriorly are kind of flattened and the optic nerves are a little bit kinked. And it, this could be normal, but it is present with her. On sagittal view of the MRI, you notice that the pituitary is just a little bit squished. It's not totally full. It's not an empty cella. It's partial empty cella. And it could be a normal finding, but she does have that. And then on the coronal view, her optic nerves are fairly full, a little bit distended. Again, could be normal finding, but she does have that on MRI. So Dr. Werner uh, performed visual exam. Blood pressure was normal. Heart rate was a little bit elevated. Acuity was 20-30 in both eyes. Um, uh, extraocular movements were intact. And intraocular pressures were on the high side, but normal, measured in two different ways. Pupils were equally reactive. She did not have an APD. Anterior chambers were clean and quiet, clear and quiet. Uh, though the fun on fundoscopic examination, she did have four plus optic disc edema bilaterally. And then she did have some mild deficits in color vision. So these are the pictures um, that were taken of the, of the um, discs. And as you can appreciate, they're um, really edematous. There's some tortuous vessels in there. Um, on visual, humphrey visual fields, the fields aren't great, and granted, she, she, I guess she wasn't a great visual fields taker, but these look pretty bad, and they're actually worse than the records sent from the outside uh, uh, optometrist office. She also did uh, amateur visual gr grids, and she did report having wavy lines in the temporal fields of either eye, which could also be sign early signs of uh, elevated intracranial pressure. So. Uh, increased ICP, which manifests as papilledema in the eyes, can relate to visual loss, or associated with visual loss, and there's several theories behind this. One being axonal stasis in the nerve that could cause ischemia, or orbital venous stasis, um, which then causes hypertension and visual loss. And then there could be structural causes to it, so dilated vent ventricles causing traction of the optic pathways and then leading to visual loss. So the point of the talk was to uh, kind of go through this protocol. So this is the NCCU protocol for management of vision, uh, vision threatening papilledema. It's something that Dr. Warner um, put together, formalized um, earlier this year. And uh, this was in collaboration with Dr. Richard Schmidt in neurosurgery. And it's actually been uh, approved by uh, neurosurgery as well as ophthalmology and neurology. So it's a way, a, a protocol to help um, uh, formalize how you would treat such patients. So the first step, of course, is someone needs to notice that there is optic nerve edema. Could this be due to increased intracranial pressure? So the first step is to get an ophthalmology consult and have someone assess, is this really vision threatening? And that could be you know, based on physical, physical exam, um, clinical impression combined. And if it is not vision threatening, then that could be managed outpatient using outpatient treatments. Some of these uh, include acetazolamide. Um, that's been shown in several clinical trials to help with um, 
intracranial, uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, um, chlorothaldone, prednisone, some surgical management techniques, orbital nerve sheath fenestration, as well as even bariatric surgery that's helped with these patients with uh, IIH. And then there's some newer treatments that um, are being tested. But, but if the patient does have some sort of other reason to be uh, inpatient, some other neurological disorder, then of course you go to the next step. So you admit them and decide, is there some sort of immediately treatable cause, like an uh, intracranial lesion that could be resected? So those things could be some sort of mass lesion, intra -ax or extraaxial lesion, pituitary tumor, and in that case, of course, that the lesion gets taken care of, and then they follow up with ophthalmology outpatient. Um, but in, as in the case for this patient, if the MRI looks good and there's not really anything to n treat neurosurgically, then you go to this um, kind of key piece of the pipeline. Um, admit the patient, and um, initially you have to do some things to rule out other, pro other causes of increased ICP, including things like venous sinus thrombosis, so doing a CTA via endocrine abnormalities. Sleep apnea can cause increased ICP, but if after ruling all those out, um, one would have um, a lumbar puncture done, and the pressure is actually measured. And if the pressures are increased, then place consider either doing repeat punctures or placing a lumbar drain. Um, and a neurosurgeon can do that um, in the ICU. And so while the patient has the drain put in, you would arrange for an optic nerve sheath fenestration, ideally, and have that done as soon as possible. And in the meantime, place the patient on acetazolamide or steroids. Um, hopefully, through that process, their vision would improve, their headaches would improve, but if you're unable to wean them off the lumbar drain and they continue to have headaches or visual loss, then you might have to consider doing something a little more invasive like a CSF diversion procedure like a shunt. So this is kind of nicely illustrated in the hospital course of our patient. So day one, she was admitted to the NCCU under Dr. Anasari. Uh, CTV was done and did not show venous uh, sinus thrombosis. Her sinuses were pa patent. Lumbar puncture was performed, and um, unfortunately, the pressure was not measured by the resident. I did not do that puncture. But a lumbar drain was placed, and there was copious CSF output, and the patient did have improvement in her headaches afterwards. So that's a good sign. Um, she was started on acetazolamide, 500 milligrams, uh, two to eight hours, and uh, optic nerve sheet fenestration was arranged with Dr. Crum. So day two, she had uh, this procedure done. Dr. Crum elected to do bilateral fenestration, and the op note said that there was kind of a gush of fluid, so presumably the nerve was under a lot of pressure. In the meantime, uh, the lumbar drain was going at 5 to 15 mils per hour output, and so in the first, in the over the first night, she had 80 mils of output, and the second day, another 96 mils of output. And uh, so I'm just using the Snell Snellen chart. Her visual acuity is actually improved in one eye. So in the left eye, it improved from 2030 to 2020. In the other eye, it was 2040. But her symptoms improved, which is good. Uh, the following day, she had even a, a mild improvement in acuity in the right eye. The lumbar drain was clamped, and I I she was able to tolerate the drain being clamped. So that kind of signifies that she's had enough CSF taken out to kind of temporize the symptoms, and her uh, Dimox dose was increased. So on the fifth day, she was discharged, followed up in ophthalmology clinic, and a couple days later, she continued to have disc edema, but her headaches had resolved, which was great. And then actually, at the two-week mark, Dr. Warner saw her, and sh her disc edema was three plus bilaterally, and at the five-week mark, her disc edema was one plus bilaterally, so she got better. So um, I just wanted to kind of bring up this last point here, fenestration versus shunting. So uh, optic nerve sheath fenestration is a really great procedure, lot, um, really not much morbidity with it. Our patient had kind of her, her right eye was swollen shut for a little while, but it got better. She was on antibiotics for a little while. Um, there are quite a few studies documenting um, visual improvements in acuity, visual fields, color perception. Um, in within the group of optic nerve sheath fenestration. So it's a reasonably low risk procedure and could be repeated if needed. Um, the downsides being that it doesn't usually treat the headache um, symptoms and it's not usually a permanent fix. Though again, the idea is that once you've got, you've done some temporizing, the patient can go out, be out, seen outpatient, they can lose some weight and hopefully that would fix the problem on its own. Um, the other procedures being um, ventri ventricular peritoneal shunting or lumbar peritoneal shunting, um, these, these 
uh, procedures do treat the headaches and the vision loss together, so that's kind of nice. But unfortunately, they do oftentimes require some patients to have numerous revisions. Some patients do really well. Um, there is, was a recent study done showing that it may be a little more effective at improving visual fields compared to shunting, but these, there are not very many studies comparing the two. And again, there's big differences between morbidity comparing the two procedures. So that's all I really have. Those are my references and uh, some questions. Mm -hmm. uh, and shunting, uh, I, I know that there are studies, in, and if you look at the more fluidity literature, it's clear that shunting is the only way to go. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, but yeah. taking care of these patients, as you know, is really a nightmare because you know, yeah. the operations and the complications, and, and sometimes it doesn't even treat the headache, and then you get a new headache, you get an indigene Yeah. The, the NEI is on the verge. I'm hopeful of funding a study that actually looks Does at Does do a head to head. That uh, would be nice. Uh, LTVT shunting versus uh, hypnosis sedation. And we have submitted our paperwork to do a study. Uh huh. Uh, Great. Nerve surgery for Schmidt. Uh huh. And with um, Dr. Patel and Dr. Plum uh -huh. on the optic nerve resuscitation. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. So, Kathleen, with all your time and experience, knowing how to do But I have to say that sometimes we do get them sedated and they don't get better uh, and they still have headaches, they still need the resistance, sometimes they do both. And um, that's really where, uh, you know, you just have to go with it, you know, your clinical judgment on that. I, I see your patient history. I think that um, when I was talking about a pretty unusual circumstance, uh, the vision starts to happen with the next year, the patient's eyes are not even there. They're not going blind. Protocols. And the Ryan from the nerve surgery mm -hmm. really the whole a bunch of problems to start with mm -hmm. before the protocol off the ground. So mm -hmm. I mean I think this for this acute hyperacute vision loss mm -hmm. where sometimes we call people call it malignant eye right, or fulminant. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean this is where where you have to go. But the bigger question, because it affects many more patients, this happens and it's horrible and it's devastating and no matter what you do, it's hopefully this protocol and save people from vision loss. 
Mm-hmm. But the bigger issue is what do we do with these other people that are in that kind of in-between sure. where mm-hmm. they're losing vision, uh, if not at rapid loss, more quick too. Mm-hmm. So, but I think it's very exciting that we have this protocol mm-hmm. um, and we've got to keep track of our, our outcomes on this because we need to publish, it, even if it's just a series of cases, because right now, if you look at malignant RA, it's the outcome is dismal um, in pers- the series that are out there, unless you move back. Yeah, just the everyone, and when you do the scan, how, man, how many? I don't know an exact percent, um, though I do, I, I was looking at the newest, recent studies have used the stenting procedure on patients that do have thrombosis, and it does seem to help with certain percentages. I don't know an actual number. And it does help when you just stretch the stenting? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Ha- what percentage have a positive CTD? I, I'm not sure. We know some, but it's, I mean, I think <laughs> the majority are, are in the center. Yeah. We saw that girl in Iowa, Todd, that we had at the end of the summer, and we had about a third of them with a fairly major stenting. Well, the phenotype of thrombosis is a diagnosis you have to exclude of every single patient you see with RA, that you think is RIH, because that is part of the criteria that So Judith premature bite syndrome, which is the syndrome of increasing pain pressure in top of knee, mm-hmm. it can look identical because it is a type of form. But our job as ophthalmologists are to rule out the secondary mm-hmm. syndrome of the disorder, which is phenotype thrombosis. But these hyper acute, a lot of these hyper acute ones have been published and everything, where it is rapid. But you can see people with the phenotype thrombosis present with this hyper acute withdrawal. But then you have to, you add another area. You have to get these people anticoagulated because if you don't anticoagulate them, the mm-hmm. then they form the everything from from this loss of vision. So the vision ends up being kind of a secondary issue to the primary issue, which is the phenotype thrombosis. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Sweet. Thank you, Dr. Sweet. Yeah. That's very good. Um, and MR guinea guineas are okay, but they're ultra suspect. They're kind of scary with that. And um, so if you suspect it, uh, in any of these very malignant cases, you'll see us always rule out the phenotype of thrombosis, just to be clear. Yeah. We don't have a secondary thing we have to be worried about. Thank you. Sorry, just briefly, uh, as they switch over our speakers, I, I just want to take a moment to introduce one of our international guests, uh, Dr. Frank, if you wouldn't mind standing. Uh, Frank is a good friend. Frank is uh, from Tanzania. He's at the University of Dodoma, just finished his own residency within the past couple of years. Spent the majority of his time teaching at the university, and he, he is the only ophthalmologist for 2.5 million people. Uh, he's our key person and partner in Tanzania, uh, where he Next up is Walla Awan. Um, he's going to be presenting on the management of pituitary adenoma. He's another neurosurgery resident at Georgia Mason here. Thanks. All right. Good morning. You guys are getting hammered with neurosurgery today, huh? Um, so I'm going to present a patient that we saw in clinic uh, with Dr. Um, Warner. This was a 60-year-old male uh, who came in with past medical history of strabismus and amoblia of the left eye who presents with uh, worsening peripheral vision. The patient uh, was uh, initially had a fall while jogging, sustained a pretty serious facial laceration, and uh, was seen at an ED. Uh, they obtained a head CT to route any kind of um, 
uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, and uh, they ended up finding an incidental uh, stellar mass. Um, so you can see there, the, the rest of his history is um, non confirmatory. Uh, on physical exam, he was found to have uh, severe peri-overall ecchymosis at that left eye, um, and a left uh, infraorbital laceration that he sustained from the fall. His visual acuity in the right eye was 20 on 20, and um, 20 over 400 with correction in the left eye, and um, that, that's a stable uh, eye exam. He also had asymptomatic um, mesotrophy of the left eye. We obtained uh, visual fields due to the complaints of the uh, uh, peripheral vision loss, and you can see them there showing quadrinopsia of the, of the lower right and, and upper left uh, quadrant in the left eye. So this is what the CT head looked uh, like on his initial uh, um, workup in the ED. And uh, you can see this uh, abnormally large mass in the region of the uh, pituitary. And then on the sagittals, you can see that it is, in fact, uh, a cellar lesion. This is what the uh, MRIs look like with and without. So you can see this large contrast enhancing uh, cellar mass. And uh, on the sagittals, uh, once again, you can kind of reapproximate. On the sagittals, you can also uh, make out what it could be where the optic chiasm, uh, which is a little bit superiorly displaced due to the mass. Uh, I just want to show a quick demonstration. Um, the patient was ultimately uh, admitted and evaluated by neurosurgery, and uh, he ended up having a transpenoidal resection. Uh, for a presumed uh, pituitary adenoma. Um, these are the speculums that will insert into the nares and it helps separate the turbinates laterally. You initially go in and you want to cauterize any bleeding that you encounter and, and, and mucosa. And then the posterior septum is uh, normally uh, fractured off just to increase, um, in, uh, uh, increase the working space uh, in that region. So that's the posterior septum coming off there. Uh, eventually, you'll make it, so here's, here, here's the, the sphenoid um, uh, sinus, I'm sorry, uh, the, uh, the uh, I'm sorry, the sphenoid sinus, and you can see how, how, how thin it was. You can just usually fracture it off, and then immediately you can see uh, this kind of mass protruding. Let's speed this up here a little bit. So uh, next, what's inserted is a pituitary retractor, which is just this ring that you see here on this instrument. Um, you place it into the region of the cella, and retract, and uh, the adenoma tissue tends to be a little bit more friable, and so it's uh, easily retracted. And once there's a sufficient resection obtained, um, Dr. Caldwell likes to uh, always pack with uh, a fat graft to um, reduce the risk of, of uh, CSF leak postoperatively. So that's what the, the surgical um, side of things looks like. I just want to talk about some of the um, medical management aspects as well. So pituitary adenomas are actually quite common. And they're about 15, 20% of all intracranial tumors uh, with a relatively um, high prevalence rate. You can see there, 77.6 per 100,000. Uh, there are two major categories of, of pituitary adenomas. Uh, one is based on size and the other is based on functionality. So the microadenomas are anything less than one centimeter in size. Um, and then the other major category is uh, whether or not the adenoma is functional, so actively secreting, um, uh, actively secreting hormone uh, versus a, a non-functional lesion. Um, and uh, many of these lesions will, will present with symptoms of, of hypopituitarism. This is just a, a quick overview of the regional anatomy to help us kind of understand some of the the visual uh, complaints. You see the pituitary gland and the, and the cells. It's just inferior to where the optic chiasm um, <coughs> would kind of course over. And then uh, in the adjacent uh, region, there's a lot of uh, cranial nerve and vascular uh, structures that could um, also potentially cause um, visual, visual uh, deficits. Uh, and then Patients with pituitary adenomas um, tend to present with symptoms of headache and, and bitemporal 
hemianopsia classically, uh, but visual deficits can often be subtle because these lesions tend to grow slowly, and so patients don't always immediately uh, appreciate them. In this particular patient, um, he thinks that he's had this kind of peripheral vision loss for, for possibly over a year, just kind of drastic, slow, slowly, <coughs> getting, slowly getting worse. Uh, and many times, we'll find uh, patients present after like a car accident or something where they don't realize that they have loss of their peripheral uh, vision uh, until something like a car accident happens and they still see a car coming out of their periphery and, uh, and then I'll look up, they're found to have you know, this pituitary lesion. And uh, as I was mentioning, larger lesions can expand laterally and cause compression of the third, fourth, and sixth nerves, which uh, can cause symptoms of diplopia. Uh, and then um, because you know, there's endocrine uh, function as the main, main function of the, uh, of the pituitary, uh, uh, patients will often present with some form of, of dysfunction, either uh, hypersecretion or hyposecretion. Um, so when you're diagnosing these patients, you, you always want to obtain baseline uh, pituitary function. Uh, and, uh, and then, as you saw, the CT and MRI is fairly standard workup. Also, obtaining visual fields uh, and a full ophthalmologic exam is, is important, um, mainly to establish kind of baseline functions that we can monitor for progression. Sometimes these lesions can't be completely resected. And um, if you're concerned about you know, tumor growth in the future and wondering whether or not this is really causing the patients any symptoms, it would be helpful to have prior visual fields um, to compare to uh, in patients with subtotal resections, uh, which can help guide their decision making. Uh, so there are several subtypes. Uh, these are the most common. Prolactinomas, depending on the study that you're going to look at, um, are, are generally cited as being the most common versus uh, non-functional uh, adenomas being the most common, but you can see there uh, there's a wide range, about 22 to 73 percent of these lesions uh, will hypersecrete prolactin, um, but also a significant portion of these adenomas uh, will be uh, non-functional, so just uh, purely uh, in, in, uh, hyperplasia of the tissue, but uh, no active secretion of any hormone. And then you can see growth hormone secretion um, comes in around third. Uh, and then Cushing's type of uh, uh, syndromes comes in a little bit later. The, uh, the subtype of the pituitary adenomas are important because a lot of the treatment regimens uh, are kind of, um, uh, the well, you'll get different responses depending on the type of uh, secretion that the tumor is producing. So for um, prolactinomas, they generally respond pretty well to uh, dopamine agonists. And um, the, the two classical are the uh, bromocryptine and the, uh, the curvergiline. So both of these um, act in a similar fashion. Um, they've both been shown to, to decrease tumor size um, and hormone secretion. Um, but randomized controlled trials uh, demonstrated that uh, curvergiline actually is more efficacious. That's usually the first line therapy. And in prolactinomas, they're always trialed on a medication. Uh, or on a dopamine agonist before, you know, uh, a surgical resection is considered just because um, these generally work pretty well. Uh, in the case of growth hormone secreting uh, tumors or ACTH secreting tumors, uh, there, you know, agonists, ex uh, antagonists exist and agonists exist that you can use to treat symptoms, but they generally do not respond as well uh, to the, pro the prolactinomas. Um, so generally, these lesions are treated surgically uh, and then any kind of uh, symptoms can be managed uh, post-operatively with, um, uh, with some, some medications, either a somatostatin agonist uh, versus an uh, inhibitor of, of steroid synthesis. In dealing with these patients post-operatively, uh, you know, it's pretty standard to get post-operative visual fields for the reason that I mentioned earlier. If you're considering taking a patient back for a second resection due to progressive growth, there's always the decision to be made of, you know, is the patient really being symptomatic um, and, and having something objective like a visual field test uh, is um, important in guiding that decision making. Um, I did come across a, a nice review of uh, specifically visual symptoms uh, after transphenoidal resections for patients with pituitary uh, adenoma. So in, in the series of 67 patients, um, all of them had some kind of visual deficit, either a, vi a visual field deficit or acuity. And you can see here that uh, at six months follow-up, um, 
the majority of people, 77%, uh, cited a uh, improved uh, overall visual field. Um, and surprisingly, 34% uh, uh, went back to their normal state. And in, in, in the case of visual acuity, the, the results were not as dramatic, but um, still important to consider. 45% uh, improved and, and 13 were able to go back to their um, or normal or baseline visual acuity. 23 of the patients um, that were in this series uh, had visual field deficits that were uh, less than a year old and 82% uh, of them um, had uh, improvement, just indicating that getting patients uh, to be seen sooner rather than later could have important um, implications for uh, his visual field function. Uh, and then in a sub-analysis of patients who were noted to have um, optic nerve uh, atro atrophy, they did a sub-analysis of visual field improvement and acuity, uh, and they found that you know, you did get, uh, again, some significant improvement with 50% uh, having an improved visual field uh, at that six-month follow-up, uh, and 23% able to achieve uh, normal visual fields, and likewise with the visual acuity, 22% um, were able to improve. Obviously not as dramatic. Um, the patients who did have optic nerve uh, uh, atrophy were noted to have symptoms for um, longer periods of time, notably about two years, two to three years. Uh, and so they didn't um, have uh, a, as good of a recovery. And then of course you want to obtain um, a pan pituitary panel after all these resections, uh, simply because um, a lot of times these patients will become pan, um, you know, uh, have suffer from pan hypo uh, pituitaryism and uh, you'll have to replace some uh, important hormones, notably, uh, you know, cortisol function and DDAP for patients who have symptoms of DI. For patients who are unable to obtain um, complete surgical resection or patients who have particularly aggressive lesions or if they're incredibly small, um, these, these types of lesions can uh, benefit from adjuvant radiation therapy. Uh, in this particular study, um, they treated uh, several types of uh, pituitary adenomas. The, the first one were the non-functional group. Uh, you can see there were 60 patients there. And this group was uh, certainly the largest. You can see the average uh, lesion size. Um, and because of that, it, it received on average the s smallest dose of radiation because that was distributed over that larger area. Um, a relatively uh, small cure rate, so cure rate here means that the pituitary adenoma was um, completely gone on follow-up imaging, um, but uh, they all had uh, they all had reacted to uh, the treatment, indicating um, that they had uh, gotten smaller in size. And then control indicates whether or not they had continued progression after treatment, and this indicates that they um, uh, the treatment was actually very efficacious. That 96.7 percent of these lesions were able to be controlled. Uh, the patients that really benefited the most were uh, patients who had ACTH secreting pituitary adenomas. Um, and the reasoning here was these tended to be the smallest types of lesions. And so per the area treated, they, they acquired the highest dose of radiation. Uh, and so they had a cure rate of 30% um, and a control rate of 100%. And then importantly, um, they were also able to, to gain um, uh, ho uh, hormonal normalization at higher rates than any of the other tumors uh, that were treated or, or pituitary adenoma subtypes. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, pituitary adenomas are, are relatively common um, and can uh, will often present with visual field deficits. Treatment is, is largely dependent on uh, the size and the functional status of the tumor. Uh, and uh, visual, fe visual field deficits are, are more likely to be improved compared to visual acuity deficits, just simply because visual acuity deficits are often associated with uh, optic nerve uh, atrophy and, and long-standing compression. And that's uh, all I have.
have pretty good news. I did the numbers right. It's really good change of this vote. Do you know if they did that in that study? It was. No, they, they, they didn't look at that. It was, it was kind of an older study, um, but it was the only one that I could find that was specifically isolated towards, um, you know, looking at uh, visual field and acuity uh, in these types of lesions. So this one was from, I think, 95, so a little bit older than the study, so I don't think they did that. All right, thank you. So last but not least, uh, I'm Russell, I know most of you. Uh, so I'm gonna be presenting some cases for uh, speed's sake. You all got a homework assignment from Alicia. I imagine most of you probably weren't great at doing your homework assignment, but that's okay. Your cases, I printed out some very, the cases, so I'm gonna breeze through the three cases really quick, but during the rest of my presentation, if you'd like to review them, and then we'll have a little discussion about the three cases. Again, I have no financial disclosures. We'll do uh, the cases and then a discussion of the literature. So the first case is a 28-year-old that presented to Neuro Ophthalmology Clinic, to Dr. Warner's clinic, with complaints of worsening vision in the right eye over the last eight to nine months. They had been seen by their uh, local optometrist who couldn't find any reason, had ordered an MRI, which was normal, and had referred the patient to Neuro Ophthalmology for further evaluation. He uh, works as an IT specialist at a local company. His vision is correctable to 20-20 in both eyes, uh, but his manifest refraction has a little more uh, astigmatism in the right eye than the left eye, and the rest of his exam was quite unremarkable, including the anterior part of his exam. His visual field, which we had, you can just see there's some generalized depression of the field in the right eye, uh, particularly centrally, but otherwise relatively unremarkable. And then Dr. Warner astutely got a corneal topography, which shows some asymmetric astigmatism um, with some radial skew, which would be concerning for possibly some early keratoconus um, versus just an asymmetric uh, astigmatism. So the questions to consider during the rest of my presentation is what other tests you might order if you were seeing this patient in follow-up? How frequently would you want to see this patient in follow-up? And then if you have a patient that has correctable vision to 2020 but has documented progressive keratoconus, uh, what recommendations might you give that patient? Second patient is a older patient with known keratoconus for the last six years, uh, worsening visual function over the last year, um, left greater than right, but has become contact lens intolerant in both eyes, um, otherwise relatively healthy. His vision is correctable with glasses to 2040 in the right eye, his count fingers in the left eye and no real significant improvement with glasses. Um, has a Fleischer ring in both eyes and then fairly significant thinning and some scarring in the left eye. His keratometry, so in the right eye, you'll see um, steep Ks at 60s with a stigmatism of close to 10 um, with the simulated keratometry. And then the steep Ks in the left eye, which is the poor function visualized up to 87 and 80, so fairly significant. Um, just an example of the placido rings, which is where you get the topography, you can sort of appreciate the displacement of the cone. And then this individual uh, got pentacam imaging, which is a really nice way to A, map out the astigmatism, but also map out both the corneal thickness, uh, let's see, the corneal thickness here, and then also your anterior elevation map. So um, how elevated the front of the cornea is relative to a control or vestibule sphere, and the same posteriorly. And importantly, just for those who haven't seen a lot of pentacams, uh, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that oftentimes if you look at the posterior float or the back part of the cornea, maybe a good way to pick up um, keratoconus earlier, you'll see there's a larger deviation in the back than the front. And a lot of that is due to sort of epithelial remodeling. So you have thinning of the corneal epithelium over the cone, um, which will mask some of the protrusion anteriorly, but not posteriorly. Um, the left eye, you can see, again, very significant, um, with very significant um, both anterior and posterior um, elevation. So the questions for this would be, what uh, options for management would you consider in this patient's right eye and left eye? Um, and then if you're considering an, a patient with advanced keratoconus with corneal thinning and scarring, uh, what would make you maybe decide between a DALK DA and a PKP? And then lastly, for all those cataract surgeons out there, a uh, 68-year-old who's status post uh, cataract surgery in the left eye, had LRIs done in that eye, presented to the VA for cataract surgery in the right eye. Um, his visual acuity is 2060. 
He refracts to 20-25 in the left eye, um, has kind of a nuclear cataract with a little bit of PSC, and then this is his topography. Again, sort of this asymmetric uh, appearance to uh, with a sort of inferior steepening. Um, and this is the left eye, which has already had cataract surgery. Um, we said he came over to the Moran and got some imaging. And you can see he does have some subtle elevation in the back. Um, this is a ectasia risk factor that's actually used for um, refractive surgery screening. But you can see there is some signs that he likely probably had at one point, maybe has stabilized, but has evidence of sort of posterior elevation and keratoconus. The same with the left eye. Um, his lens star, which shows a little bit more astigmatism, 2.31. His uh, IOL master, which again shows a little bit more, so about two. Oh, I will not go through all the calcs because you have them all in front of you. But the question I would be curious about is what IOL you, anyone in the room would place. So you have someone which we can't get him to take any um, astigmatism. Uh, he has these levels of astigmatism that are sort of at a relatively consistent axis. Um, but would you consider putting a toric lens in? Would you not put a toric lens in? Would you consider doing an LRI? Or would you just put a plano lens in? Uh, or an aspheric lens and then see how he does. Uh, so a quick review um, of keratoconus. So for those of you who are unfamiliar or just want a refresher. So keratoconus is a non-inflammatory, it's usually bilateral progressive thinning and protrusion of the cornea. Um, and in terms of epidemiology, it's a little bit difficult, mostly because the diagnostic criteria um, are not sort of well-defined and agreed upon, and they've sort of been evolving over time. But if you look at sort of various uh, literature, you'll get a prevalence rate between 50 and 230 per 100,000. Um, and like I said, primarily bilateral disease. Uh, if you're looking with sort of modern topography and t uh, tomography, the rates are usually 2 to 4% for unilateral disease. So it's usually a bilateral process. Starts in puberty, will progress over approximately 10 to 20 years, and then will typically stabilize. Um, oftentimes, we'll present with progressive blurring or distortion of the vision, similar to the patient that presented to Dr. Warner's clinic. Um, they may have some photophobia glare or monocular diplopia as well from the asymmetric astigmatism. Uh, a quick review of sort of some of the clinical signs. So you have uh, Vogue stria, which you'll get some uh, vertical stress lines that you'll be able to see in the cornea. Uh, Munson signs, which is if you have the patient look down, you'll be able to see the displacement of the upper eyelid. Uh, Rizzuti sign, which is if you're bringing light from a very tangential angle, you can, in essence, sort of get the reflection of the cone on the uh, nasal iris. Um, the Fleischer ring, which is tough to see here, but this patient does have this corneal ring that kind of goes around the area of the cone. Corneal thinning, and then you'll get this annular red reflex. Um, and there's great videos. If you ever haven't seen scissoring of a red reflex, just Google it uh, today. It's uh, pretty unique, and uh, I think it's, if it's a probably Dr. Tabin would tell us at the VA it's a very underutilized um, test because we don't oftentimes retinoscope our patients, but it's a really nice way to kind of appreciate what the light that's entering the patient's eye is doing. Um, other testing to consider, contrast sensitivity. Like we said, the topography, tomography, which would be like Pentacam imaging. Um, and then the pachymetry. Um, so in terms of ideology, this is one of the frustrating things about keratoconus. There's, a, there's not a great understanding of exactly what causes it, and there's lots of opinions and theories about it. Um, certainly there's lots of people who have found that there's an association with keratoconus, those people with keratoconus, that they tend to rub their eyes more than normal people do. Um, but there's people who have postulated this could represent some sort of chronic microtrauma that then may lead to some of the pathologic changes that are seen. Um, there's been documentation of ele elevated lysozymal enzymes that are expressed in the host epithelium, um, which could lead to sort of some stromal weakness. Um, and there's been a number of different enzymes that have been postulated. Um, there's also increased uh, IL-1 binding sites that have been documented in keratocytes of keratoconic patients. Um, and IL-1 has been shown to uh, induce apoptosis in stromal <laughs> keratocytes in vitro, so there's some feeling that this may represent a pathway. Um, there's also definitely a strong uh, hereditary or genetic component. Um, if you look at the general prevalence rates and then you look at the inheritance estimates, approximately 6% of those uh, first degree relatives of patients that have keratoconus will also have keratoconus. So there's obviously some sort of genetic component. 
Um, there's been a lot of different genes that have been proposed, both by linkage analysis and other uh, processes, but there's no really definitive um, gene that's been identified yet at this point. Um, and this VizX1 is one of the more promising ones. It's on chromosome 20, but again, there's some <laughs> reports that say that it's not, not very strongly associated. So. Um, systemic association, I think one of the really important things to consider is that a lot of patients with keratoconus will also have concurrent atop atopic disease, and this will make them more likely to be rubbing their eyes, which may also lead to increased progression. And so just ad addressing that as a factor and trying to decrease any aspect of allergic lid disease that they might have um, to help both improve contact lens tolerance and then also decrease the amount of eye rubbing that they're doing can be really important. There's a number of other associations, Down syndrome, um, a significant f number of people with keratoconus have mitral valve prolapse, um, and then there's lots of other case reports of all sorts of, uh, oftentimes uh, mixed sort of connective tissue disorders, but other things as well. Important sort of considerations when thinking about keratoconus, just to review for the resonance. So corneal hydrops is one of the things uh, that can be a complication of keratoconus. It was first described in 1900 occurs in about 2.5 to 3% of keratoconic patients, so um, not a huge percentage, but they oftentimes <coughs> will present with this redness, discomfort, photophobia, and then this sort of opaque edematous cornea, um, and the treatment is outlined there. The, the key is um, that you, you, know, you would not typically do anything acutely in terms of a PK or otherwise you would let them heal, scar down, let the edema resolve um, before you would potentially do anything typically. Um, pathologically speaking, um, the most, the thing that we always talk about when we're with Dr. Mamelis is this sort of breaks in Bowman's membrane, um, which a lot of people feel may lead to some of the structural instability. Um, there's also the epithelial thinning, um, compaction of the stromal layers, and then you get these sort of, uh, this extra decimates, and you may get breaks and decimates where it will scroll up because of its elastic nature, and then you can have scarring in the epithelium as well, long term. So one of the big uh, areas of frustration is classification of keratoconus, and there's not really a wonderfully unified uh, agreement to m in my understanding and reading as to how to appropriately classify. The oldest classification is this Amsler classification, which kind of is a grade zero through four based on the severity, with grade four being severe and normal. Uh, these were the sort of initial considerations. Those have been adjusted slightly, but you still have this sort of grade Z zero through four, which people oftentimes refer to. Uh, Rabinowitz criteria is sort of classically taught and tested on boards, which is based on corneal topography measurements. But more recently, there's been a lot of these indexes, um, which I won't go into in depth, but that try to use data from either topography or tomography um, to better classify those uh, patients that, to better sort of risk stratify patients in terms of the severity of their keratoconus. But the problem is a lot of this is based on the structural abnormalities and not necessarily the visual function. Um, and so if you have someone that has a fairly significant structural abnormality um, without scarring, but they're able to get a really good like scleral lens fit, they may actually be able to see really well um, despite having fairly significant changes on their topography or tomography. Um, we want to try to get up towards the differential. So I did want to quickly just highlight some of the treatment options. Um, I will cut this short so we can get to the discussion, but I'll send out this PowerPoint so that people have um, it for their own review. I think the important part to remember is that non-surgical options are a really good option for patients, even after they've oftentimes had some of these surgeries, um, consideration of glasses, but also importantly, sort of uh, customizable contact lenses, whether that be scleral lenses um, or other things can be a really good option. So um, a classification of the different sizes of lenses, and the important thing is, you know, a lot of these patients will be in just a corneal RGP, a while ago, a lot of people felt that you should have the lens rest on the cone to try to decrease progression. There's been um, a number of studies that have shown that that's probably actually not helpful and may lead to hypoxia and maybe some microtrauma. So generally, my understanding, Dr. Olson, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that more people are going towards this sort of apical clearance or a three-point touch, which is where you have this really faint touch on the cone, but not significant resting on the cone. Um, the other lenses that are available, a corneal scleral, which is just slightly larger than a corneal RGB, and then a mini scleral or a scleral lens, where you're in essence uh, resting the lens on the sclera and then vaulting over the entire cornea. And there's lots of information about that, but we'll come back to 
Um, hybrid lenses provide a nice option. Um, visually speaking, scleral lenses and hybrid lenses have been shown in studies to have fairly similar visual outcomes, but a lot of patients find these to be more comfortable um, because they have sort of a soft contact lens skirt, so that's also another option to consider. Um, from a surgical standpoint, so for those patients who have non-progressive keratoconus, um, whose cornea is thick enough, you may consider placing a uh, corneal ring segment. In the United States, that would be an Intax. There's some other ones that are available outside the U.S. and are going through FDA clearance, um, but Intax are currently the only ones that are available. There's two different sizes available in the U.S. Again, the considerations, you ideally probably want to have a non-progressive patient. Um, you Oftentimes this is done in patients who are contact lens intolerant in an attempt to maybe make them contact lens tolerant by decreasing their Ks. And importantly, uh, you want their corneal thickness to be greater than 450 at the seven millimeter optical zone. If they're too thin peripherally, then you're not gonna have, it probably isn't gonna be safe to go ahead and put the intex because they may either extrude, they have a higher risk of extrusion at that point. Um, this goes over the procedure and the nomogram. Um, I think just importantly, looking at some of the series of it, the benefit of it is that you can, you know, have a decent si reduction in both the keratometry and the stigmatism, but it doesn't, it's not a cure-all. So I think it's important for patients to realize if they're having intacts, it's not going to make them uh, independent of their need for glasses or contacts. In most cases, they're still going to need something, um, but it's an attempt to maybe get them so they can be contact lens tolerant again or have a slight improvement in their uncorrected distance visual acuity. Um, there's mixed data on progression after intact. Some studies say that you don't progress after intact. Some studies show that there has been progression after intact, so we won't go into that. There definitely is um, associated explantation, so 7% in this study, 23% in this study. So just important to note, uh, not everyone's going to tolerate these or they may extrude um, depending on the surgical technique or other things. Um, some of these were just taken out because they didn't really improve the patient, so there wasn't any refractive improvement. Um, so it's not uncommon to have to explant them. Corneal cross-linking is an option that's not FDA approved yet. Um, if you're, usually you want someone who's thicker than 40 micro, 400 microns. If they're thinner than that, you can use a hypotonic solution to try to swell their cornea. Um, and this just goes through the process. There's both, the classic process is to remove the epithelium similar to PRK and then do it. There's a lot of people who have looked at epi-on techniques uh, the problem is riboflavin doesn't penetrate quite as well. Um, and the U.S. data on this is, should be published soon in terms of the biggest study on it. But there's definitely some studies that have shown that there's probably equivalent or slightly less um, improvement, but still fairly good improvement with epi-on cross-linking. Um, a newer technique, which some of you may not have heard, is Bowman layer transplantation. So the idea being the pathology is a break in Bowman's layer. Um, so there's been a few case reports of people actually transplanting Bowman's layer into a midstromal pocket that can either be created with a femto laser or with a manual dissection. Um, and while there's a fairly wide standard deviation, there they have shown that there's a reduction in Ks. Um, again, this would be used in patients that were too thin for cross-linking but had steep corneas and you were trying to maybe make contact lens tolerant as opposed to having giving them a transplant. Um, then there's DALK. Um, and PKPs for those patients with severe uh, disease with scarring. I think the important thing to remember is if you look at sort of five-year endothelial loss as well as graft rejection, DALK is probably a better option for most patients. Um, it's a little bit m probably more surgically difficult. Um, and so, you know, if possible, tr attempting a DALK is probably a better option because it leaves the patient's host endothelium so they're less likely to have a rejection episode. And you're also not entering the eyes, so you're, they're less likely to have complications such as cataracts or other stuff long term. Um, and then there's some people, not many in the States, but elsewhere who are doing combination therapy, particularly sort of combined accelerated cross-linking with same-day PRK. Again, an attempt to uh, cross-link and stabilize the cornea, but also improve the refractive outcome. And there's fairly good data to support that this is um, a decent option. You can see they're sort of doing limited ablations. Uh, so they're trying not to exceed more than 50 microns worth of tissue because you have an uh, eye that has an ectatic process, which is why they're cross-linking. So case conclusion. Uh, case one has missed three cornea appointments, despite me calling and suggesting that he might want to come in. Uh, but I would just be curious, is there any other test from a resident standpoint that you guys would consider? 
getting, the, again, this patient just had a topography. Yeah, so pentacam imaging would be really helpful. And then I was curious from an attending standpoint, I don't know if this patient presented to your clinic, how often you would recommend following up on this patient uh, to see if there's documented progression, if you would see them every three months, every six months, every year. But if they were younger, like 18, 19, 20, would you see them yeah, every six months? Okay. Sounds good. Aggressive in. Yeah. And then the other question for this one is if you have documented progressive keratoconus in a young patient that's still correctable to 2020, uh, obviously ideally if the FDA would approve cross-linking, you'd probably cross-link them. But I'm just curious what your uh, sort of recommendation would be at this point. Uh, case two, uh, again, there's the questions. This patient ended up having intact placement in the right eye and a PKP in the left eye, um, and sort of post-operatively. I just wanted to show you an important thing when you're looking at these, it can be really difficult. If you're looking at this standard palette, which has a set number here, it can be difficult to see if this patient's really improved that significantly with intact. If you take a sort of auto scale, so then it will go to sort of adjust for the highest level of astigmatism, you can see there's been you know some improvement in terms of that. So it's just something to consider when you're looking at your topography, what your scale is. Um, oops, sorry. So I guess the question that I wanted to pose in particular was in advanced keratoconus with corneal thinning and scarring, is there considerations that you guys as attendings make in deciding whether to do a DALK or a PKP or do you attempt a DALK in everyone? High drops, then you wouldn't. Otherwise, I, I would do 
Um, and then case three, just quickly. So here was your astigmatism. So uh, we put a SN60 lens on this patient, um, and they were 20-30 postoperatively, and he didn't want glasses. He was super happy with his vision as it was, and he didn't want contact lenses. He just loved his 20-30 vision, which was fine. Um, so I guess the question that I was curious is, uh, attendings here, if there's what considerations you would possibly do? Would you ever put a torque lens in someone who looked like they had steribol keratoconus with sort of irregular astigmatism? Um, or would you always put a non-torque lens in? Would you ever consider doing an LRI? Um, so I just open it up to the floor. No, we did not discuss that, but that would have been a good idea to talk about. Very good. Just a note on that on the second one, it says two values. Yep. Yep. Thank you.